Amen. The Lord is good. His mercies endure forever. Let's continue to put our trust in Him and Him alone. He is the rock of our salvation. He is everything to us and He sits on the throne of grace in a light which no man can approach to, but which He invites us to come by the way of the blood to seek help in time of need. Brothers and sisters, the kingdom we are called to be part of is a kingdom in which the Lord has measured the length, the breadth, the height, the width, and everything. And actually, it's a misnomer for anybody to say you are building the kingdom. The kingdom has already been measured out. You can only discover your place in it and fulfill your part in it and allow other people to discover and fulfill their part in it. And that's why the kingdom is complementary, not competitive. The more people mature, the more they know these realities. Today, we're going to have two lessons this morning and later this evening that will essentially pinpoint the core of all issues about apostasies, heresies, errors, and the pseudo-gospel. The very root of it is what we're going to be identifying in these two lessons today. Stay with us, Father in heaven, the great I am who I am. We trust you in all things. We know your word is dependable. Lord, we pray that you will encourage every one of your children to know that you are who you are. Lord, reveal yourself to all those who you need to. And let your name be exalted through this word today. Holy Spirit will give you right away. In Yeshua's name, amen. Today, we continue in course 134, Apostasies, Heresies, Errors, and the Pseudo-Gospel with Lesson 5, Biblical Chronicles of Falling Away from the Faith, Part 2. We looked at Part 1 yesterday. In this lesson, we'll focus on the warnings about these diversions from the Gospel Satan was unleashing and will yet unleash on the church from the first century right through to the end of the age. In order to understand the full import of some of the things revealed to John, the beloved apostle, let us first note that he received the revelation of divinity of Yeshua like no other person. No other person received the depth and the breadth of the revelation of the divinity and humanity of Yeshua, John was able to say in John 1, 1 to 3, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was it Elohim. The Word was Elohim. The same was in the beginning with Elohim. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. This was John. And then in the book of First John chapter 1, he said from verse 1 and 2, that which was from the beginning, the same Yeshua, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, we've seen it. And bear witness and show unto you that eternal life that was with the Father was manifested to us. So John began to show us that he got the revelation of the divinity of Yeshua. And not only the divinity of Yeshua, John also got proper contact with his humanity. John was so intimate with Yeshua, he was in a class of his own. Remember, there was the inner three, the innermost circle of Yeshua three, but there was a John who was his confidant, the one he could tell about who was going to betray him. He didn't tell any other person. It was just John. And brothers and sisters, it's important that we know that John was given revelation of the divinity and John experienced the humanity of Yeshua. He ate with Yeshua. He handled that. So, this gives you a little bit of background for why John was chosen as the instrument to identify the corrosive and deadly errors and heresies which were sprouting up in his day. So, John number one, was used to call out the dangerous doctrines which deny divinity of Yeshua or his humanity. He was used to call it out. Now, the Lord, you know, among these doctrines that a basically was sprouted in his day was one that said, you know, Yeshua, is he really God? That they doubted it. And then another one, which is called Gnosticism, doubted, you know, whether he was really 
you know, the very God, very man that was in the Bible. So John gave a few, you know, thesis to kind of pull the rug off their feet in the book of First John chapter 2 from verse 18. Look at what John said. Little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists. The spirit of Antichrist was already evident. Whereby we know that it is the last time, verse 19, they went out from us, King James Version, they went out from us, the open source King James Version, they went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, that no lies of the truth, who is a liar. But he that denied that Yeshua is the Messiah, who is a liar, but he that denied that Yeshua is the Messiah. He is Antichrist that denied the Father and the Son. If you deny the Son, you deny the Father. If you deny the identity of Yeshua, you are no longer in the faith. Then he says, he is Antichrist that denied the Father and the Son. Whosoever denied the Son, verse 23, the same has not the Father. If you deny the Son and what the Bible says of him, you don't have the Father. He that acknowledged the Son and the Father also, let that therefore abide in you, which you have had from the beginning, in that which you have had from the beginning shall remain in you. You also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise he has promised us, even eternal life. Then he said something important. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But you have an anointing which you have received from him that abided in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you all things, and is truth that is no lie, even as he taught you, shall abide in him, little children abide in him, that when he shall appear you may have confidence and not be ashamed before his coming. Why did John say this? Because if you truly are saved, you are not saved because of your head knowledge. You come by such and find Elohim. You are saved because the Father gave you a revelation of the Son. You are saved because Holy Spirit convicted you of your sin and revealed Yeshua as the sin bearer. Without the Father revealing him to you, without Holy Spirit convicting you and showing Yeshua, you can't be saved. It's not a creedal issue. It's a revelation issue. you got to have a revelation of him because before you can receive the salvation that is in him. Then in the book of 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, continuing his, you know, his um, strong denunciation of the error of his day, John said, 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are available him today. Anything you prophesy, people are saying, like, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't, be, they don't check. You don't check out. He said, believe not every spirit. He, you know, check it out. What is the Christology of a preacher? Does he understand the central place of Yeshua? Does he understand the reality of the basics of the faith, of the what the Lord has said in his word? Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. That prophet, as he is uh, the master prophet of the day, try the spirit, whether they are failing him. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. 2,000 years ago, is a many false prophets 2,000 years ago are gone out into the world. If it is so, what of today? He said, Hereby we know you the spirit of Elohim. Every spirit that confesses that Yeshua is come in the flesh is of Elohim. And every spirit that confesses not that Yeshua is come in the flesh is not of Elohim. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world. The spirit of Antichrist that will come on the last day, the spirit was already at work. The man will appear on the last time. But the spirit that will manifest in him was already going to infect the church before then. So he said, don't believe people, don't believe any spirit just like that because somebody prophesied or did anything or claimed anything. Try the spirit. Try where is it coming from. We have the ability. There's an anointing in us. 
if we are truly saved, to know when somebody is lying, to know when somebody is distorting the truth. There's an anointing in us to know when something has, is lining up with the word or is off base. If you allow that anointing to walk in you, you will never be deceived. The Lord will not allow you to be deceived. In 2 John chapter 1, 7 to 11, he says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Yeshua is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourself that we lose not those things which we have wrought. Look to yourself that you lose not what you have already received, but we might receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Yeshua has not Elohim. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, he that abideth in the doctrine of Yeshua, he had both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, nor neither bid him Godspeed. Don't tell him bye bye in person who is a peddler of error. They are carrying uh, tracts or booklets to give to you, and they don't believe in the divinity of Yeshua and his humanity. He said, Don't receive that person. This is radical. Men and brethren, for he that bid him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deed. Some years ago, a radio station out of Arkansas, you know what, uh, you know, called Kingdom Radio. Uh, we had a broadcast every week, and then we were there waiting for our time, and when we tuned in, it wasn't our time, it was the most famous preacher of Kingdom in the world at that time. This man was spewing error. He was spewing, you know, leaven. He was spewing all manner of things. I mean, this is a man people swear by. Any people who Think they would they want to know about the kingdom his books his tapes his cds were like compulsory you know what he was teaching don't preach jesus preach the kingdom jesus is not, is not important we, that's why we have not taken over the world we are preaching jesus 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 preach the kingdom preach the kingdom and people were hailing him hailing him hailing him and this man you know what he used as example? That there's this island somewhere in the Caribbean basin that, uh, you know, people don't know who is the prime minister. They come for the beach. They come for the warm water and all that. And nobody knows the prime minister. Huh? As he was speaking, Holy Spirit dropped the word in me. First Corinthians 12 verse 3. No man speaking by the spirit of Yeshua, spirit of Elohim, call it Yeshua cost. How can a man spew such error, people hailing him? Yeshua is the center and circumference of the kingdom. The kingdom is his. The power is his. The glory is his. No Yeshua, no kingdom. How can you say, put him aside and preach kingdom? That is a pseudo kingdom. That's not the real kingdom. Yet, very old saints, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years in the Lord, will take him as the very revelation of Elohim, it was such a terrible thing. Till today, believers allow themselves to be so tied to people, they love them so much that when they spew error, they can't call them out. The Lord said no. So, part of this is what is called gnosticism, is the theological name of the tendency to question the either the divinity of Yeshua or his humanity. And at the end of this lesson, we're going to give you excerpts from a scholarly work by Gary W. Derrickson in a book he wrote on 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, an exegesis. You want to go look it up, you can look it up. Men and brethren, the second thing the Lord used John to do was to show him a revelation of the church in Asia Minor. And I want to say this to you. The revelation Elohim showed John was just about less than 70 years after Yeshua had gone to heaven. Only less than 70 years. Just to tell you how terrible human nature is. To distort divine things and twist it the way it was. Look at what happened. He showed him a picture of Revelation chapter 2, Ephesus. A church that had lost its first love and was full of activity, devoid of a vibrant relationship with Elohim. Revelation 2, 1 to 7. Smyrna. The church here was found faithful in spite of its limited strength. It's a small church. Revelation 2, 8 to 11. Pegamos. The church here was polluted with the doctrine of Balaam, compromised with worldly systems and syncretism, which is when you mix 
Christian ethos with paganistic things, sacrifice and all that. Revelation 2, 12 to 17. Thyatira, the church here tolerated a situation where an immoral, illegitimate authority called Jezebel in quotes, controlled that church away from divine purpose and order. Revelation 2, 18 to 20. Men and brethren, then Revelation 3 re records the special report of Yeshua to three other churches. To one of them is Sardis, number five. Here was a church in a state of coma, barely breathing, yet it invested massively in public relations to give an impression of being alive while it was almost dead. Revelation 3, 1 to 6, Philadelphia. This church was found faithful and robust with kingdom life for which he received great commendation in Revelation chapter 3, 7 to 13. Then Laodicea, boastful and proud, this church mistook material possession as evidence of divine favor and was harshly rebuked by Yeshua in Revelation chapter 3, 14 to 22. So, out of seven churches, only two. Within 70 years, I just wanted to see, um, the Lord is trying to situate a context in with what we are going to study later today, brothers and sisters, the next lesson, that within only 70 years, five out of seven churches were falling away. If it is so, within the first 70 years, how much more? 2,000 years. Just to let you know what the Lord is going to unpack to us today. Then let's also look at the reality Yeshua told John in that examination of the churches in Revelation 2 verse 6 and Revelation 2 15. He spoke about the Nicolaitans. He says, I hate their deeds. What was the Nicolaitans? This was a new order of priesthood that was arising. Some people that say, oh, this simple gospel that Yeshua preached, this simple uncomplicated life, this life of service. No, no, no. It will make people not to respect us. So let's give ourselves colors and glory and get thrones for ourselves and become bosses over the people. Then they will respect us. And the Nicolaitans began to be a priestly system that was essentially an extension of Nimrodism, which you see in Genesis chapter 10, 8 to 10, that is brooding the people of Elohim, subduing them, and then the people are a conquered people, and then you need special clerical garments and priests, and then altar, you put a throne on the altar, so that people, when you come into the church, you don't need to be told that this is the man who owns this church. This is the authority of the church. So the, 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 the Nicolaitans rejected that thing Yeshua said in the book of Matthew 20, 20, 25 to 28 about serving, about washing the feet of others. They rejected it. They want the people to come and bow to them, men and brethren. So if you check the first century church, second and third century church, one of their biggest legacies was they left the fivefold Yeshua gave to through Paul the Apostle and went the Nicolaitan way. That's why the bishopric began to become popular. If you became a bishop of a city, you are the Lord of the city, you are the Lord spiritual. And that became what people went for. And they look at the pomp and the pageantry and they sat on the same throne level with dukes and princes and, and all the duchesses and, and all the nobles of Europe and North Africa. And the falling away continued. But then, nothing of all that John said amounts to anything compared with what the Lord showed John in Revelation chapter 17 called the Mystery Babylon. I want to share it with you now. And then in the evening, we are going to see the historical fulfillment of what John saw in John 17. This was about AD 95, less than 70 years after Yeshua rose. Yeshua came to tell John what will happen. Remember the Roman government was the ruling empire in the world. Then what did Yeshua tell him? Revelation 17, there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying, Come unto me, come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore as a prostitute, a harlot, which seated upon many waters, which rules many people group worldwide. The King James Version, open source, is a beautiful description of something that was going to happen much later in history. 
verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, the great whore. Supposedly a wife or somebody who has left the husband and was now cavorting with the kings of the earth and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of us fornication. Listen, pay attention. If you understand Revelation 17, you, you will be able to be saved from the leaven of Babylon. It's all over the place. It's playing out in HD across America, across Europe, across Africa, across Asia. And many believers are in each unawares because they don't want to be aware. Verse 3, So he carried my way in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman, a woman, sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colors and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Take note of this description heaven gave to this false system, represented as a woman, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. In other words, the spring and source of all corruption that was going to come upon the earth to him in the all through the ages until Yeshua returned was going to be basically rooted in this very thing that is unfolding in Revelation 17. And I saw, verse 6, the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Yeshua. And when I saw her, I wonder with great admiration. If you know church history, go and read the Fox's Book of Martyrs and you will be able to have an idea of how this thing played out in real life. How human beings, because of faith in Yeshua, they'll be thrown to wild animals in the Colosseum in Rome. How people were put in a spike, and spike will turn and squeeze them, and their blood will be draining out, and people will be rejoicing that they are killing believers in Yeshua. How people were burnt at the stake. People like William Tyndale, people like John Wycliffe, men of, of renown, people who believed the Lord. Their only sin was that they translated the Bible for you and I to have access to it in English, and that was all, and they were burned at the stake. Men and brethren, if you know church history, you will understand what the Lord was pointing at. Then verse 7, the angel said unto me, Wherefore did thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carried her, which had the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that the woman was riding upon had seven heads and ten horns. And this same beast, you go to Revelation 13, you see the beast. And if you look at Revelation 13, you see the beast and the prophet were in cahoots. Religion and government. Religion and politics in cahoots. Men and brethren, verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not, and yet is. So the people who are going to be confused are those whose names are not in the book of life. They may be in the physical church. They may be churchgoers. They may handsome some ministers. They may carry titles. But their names, if it is not in the Lamb's book of life, they will be subject to deception. Verse 11. And the beast that was and is not, even he that is the eight and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition, and the ten horns which thou sowest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give power and strength unto the beast. Verse 14. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Three qualifications. Many are called, few are chosen. Out of the few chosen, fewer still are going to be faithful. Brothers and sisters, this warning in the book of Revelation is one warning that 
Christians have refused to go and investigate. Men and brethren, verse 15, he said unto me, the waters with their sowers, where the whore, the harlot, the prostitute seated, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The whore will rule over a vast number of people. The largest religious expression ever seen on earth is a whore religious system. The prostitute religious system that looks like it is real with all the pomp and pageantry, but it's not real. Men and brethren, verse 16, the ten horns which thou sowest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. A time will come, the very political system that this beast depended upon shall hate the whore, shall make her desolate and naked, shall eat her flesh, shall burn her with fire. For Elohim had put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the word of Elohim shall be fulfilled. And the woman that thou sowest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Revelation 17, 1 to 18. Men and brethren, when you have time, read, study. Why is the Lord telling us these things? The Lord wants to give us an understanding of the roots of the error that the Christian church is based on. And if you are too laid back to bother, then it's late for you. I mean, that's your business. But if you want to be what the Lord wants you to be, you're going to examine, take a root cause analysis of what you believe. Where is it coming from? Is it from the beast system? Is it from the harlot system? Is it from the whore? And then you begin to make sure that you as a person, you separate yourself by the spirit and by the blood. Brothers and sisters, and when you have time, for those of you who get the teaching note, read about, you know, Gnosticism, duetic view of life, you know, and all the things from this man, um, uh, Gary W. Uh, Derrickson, adapted from his book, First, Second, and Third John, Evangelical Exegetical Commentary, is very important. So, men and brethren, the next lesson will now go to deal with how what was shown in Revelation 17, how in history, and this is available, is in the history books, is in the ecclesiastical books, the books of the church system, in black and white, you can get these things, you can read them and understand and know that the Lord loves us enough to tell us what will help us. By way of assignment number one, please summarize the warnings of John concerning attempts of some to deny the divinity of Yeshua or his humanity. Cite at least two scriptures we put at the beginning. Two, kindly share any two insights you gain from Revelation 17 already before we even go to do the exposition. You know what, brothers and sisters, we love you. And this assignment, if it's not convenient, but grace of Elohim sustains us in it. And it is that grace and the love of Elohim that causes us to continue to examine. And we don't force any man. Even those who are in the church that we oversee, you know what? We don't force them. You want to take the truth, praise God. You want to stay, you want to sleep in the midst of error, but that's for the truth. By the grace of the Lord, we're going to declare it. And even when a prize was put on our head 26 years ago, by a system, this system, even when it essentially sent hit people against us, you know what? The Lord sustained us. And I want to say this to you. What do you do with the truth? Are you going to be one of those whose faith is based on error? Or are you going to do something about it? Let us pray. Father in heaven, the great I am, who I am, we bless you because you are faithful beyond measure. Have your way and glorify Yeshua HaMashiach. Lord, let the truth come forth. And those who are interested, reveal to them and grant revelation that will cause your people to walk in victory and overcome. Let your name be exalted. We give you praise. We exalt you. We honor you. In Yeshua Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah.